Tri Medicine EI, this is Dr. JB. Dr. JB, we are on our way to your facility with a 69 year old male. Again, that 69 year old male in shortness of breath. He is very sweaty and working very hard. See you in five. See you in five. Let's do this. Dr. JB, Dr. JB, Dr. JB in the house. Hi, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. JB. Thank you so much for tuning in. On this YouTube channel, we will be going through various case scenarios of patients presenting to the emergency department with various complaints. In addition to that, we'll also have other videos where we talk in more detail about these different disease processes to help improve health literacy. So in today's video, we are going to go through a case example of a patient coming to the emergency department with shortness of breath. However, before we get into that video, please help this channel grow by subscribing to this YouTube channel, hitting that notification button so that you are notified of future videos when they're released, giving these videos a big thumbs up and sharing it with your friends and your loved ones. In the beginning of the video, we were introduced to a patient that is in route to the hospital. This is a 69 year old gentleman with shortness of breath. The paramedics say that the patient is working hard to breathe. The picture that is painted in my mind with that statement is somebody who is breathing so hard that they can't even speak. There's a continuum of, of severity in terms of difficulty breathing. Somebody who may be having difficulty breathing may just feel like they're just having a hard time taking in a deep breath, but they're able to talk and hold conversations. But then on the other end, there are people who are visibly short of breath and can't say even one or two word sentences. If you are in the more severe group of patients who are breathing so rapidly that you can't speak more than one to two word sentences, you will be seen first in the emergency department. So this patient arrives and on the gurney, we see that yes, he is indeed sweaty and yes, he is breathing very rapidly. This patient would be brought quickly to a room and the ER team would be placing him on the monitor while I would be getting information from the paramedics. Ideally, the best source of information is from the patient themselves. However, in situations when they are in distress, we can't get that information from them. And so we have to go through other sources. Many times, we just have to go based off of the way the patient looks and other, material, other information that we're able to gather through blood work and radiographic imaging to come up with a sense or an idea of what's going on with that patient. In the emergency department, we have to act fast and oftentimes we have to make decisions with very little information. So going back to the 69 year old, the paramedics brought him in. So source of information is through the paramedics. So the emergency medicine provider will position themselves in the room so that while they're talking to the paramedics, they can keep an eye on the patient as well as the cardiac monitor. While they're asking questions of the paramedics and watching as information starts showing up in the cardiac monitor, it is very common for them to interrupt that conversation they're having with the paramedics and ask their team in the ER to do different interventions. For example, once you are placed on the monitor and we see that, oh, your oxygen levels are low, then we'll realize that, oh, we need to give you some supplemental oxygen. In this case, this patient was on a nasal cannula and receiving supplemental oxygen, but his oxygen levels were still low. When you look at the patient, their mouth is open and they're breathing in and out through their mouth. So in that setting, although they're already on getting some oxygen, it shows us that they need even more oxygen. So in that situation, we'll oftentimes place you on a non-rebreather mask. This type of mask allows us to give you even more oxygen. And because you're breathing in and out through your mouth and it covers your entire nose and mouth, it will facilitate more oxygen, hopefully to get into your bloodstream. If this patient also has low blood pressure, then the team will start some IV fluids to try to help get the blood pressure higher. Some of the questions that will be asked from the paramedics include, when did this start? 
Who called you? Was it the patient or somebody else in the household? Is somebody else in the household coming to be with the patient? Did you give the patient any medications en route to the hospital that should, we should be aware of? Do you know anything about the patient's past medical history? Did you see any medications? Did you see anything in the environment from which you picked up the patient that could potentially help us in determining what is going on with the patient? After obtaining that information from the paramedics, the emergency medicine physician will then approach the patient. If the patient is still working pretty hard to breathe, they may not try to get more information from the patient in that moment. Instead, they will proceed with their physical examination. In this scenario, the patient is breathing fast, their heart rate is fast, and we hear diffuse wheezing, which is a high-pitched whistling sound in the lungs, both when the patient breathes in and when the patient breathes out. Because of the wheezing and the difficulty breathing, the emergency medicine provider will oftentimes ask for a STAT, which means extremely quick chest x-ray. The chest x-ray is obtained and blood work is sent to the lab. Upon review of the chest x-ray, there is no evidence of any signs of infection or pneumonia in the patient's lungs. With the wheezing and no signs of pneumonia, and the low oxygen levels and the shortness of breath, the physician will oftentimes order medications to help open up the patient's airways called bronchodilators, as well as likely some steroids to help decrease inflammation in the lungs. If the face mask that the patient is on does not help calm down their shortness of breath or make improvements in their oxygen levels, Oftentimes, the physician may ask that their respiratory therapist or the ER team get the patient on a BiPAP machine or CPAP machine. So these types of machines push in air into the lungs to help forcibly keep the lungs open and help improve with air exchange, meaning getting oxygen into your bloodstream and carbon dioxide out. Nine times out of 10, if a patient gets placed on this machine, it usually helps with their breathing and calms them down. This is the one step that we do prior to intubation. So if this machine is not effective and the patient is still struggling to breathe or their oxygens are still low, then intubation, meaning putting a breathing tube down your throat, is the next step. This 69-year-old patient did end up needing to be placed on a BiPAP machine because although their oxygen levels did improve to 95 on the non-rebreather, they were still breathing very rapidly and labored. Approximately 30 minutes after being placed on the BiPAP machine, the patient looks like a brand new person. Their heart rate is no longer fast, they're no longer sweating, their effort to breathe has significantly calmed down, and even their airways have improved, and there's just minimal amounts of wheezing now after being on this BiPAP or CPAP machine, as well as getting treatment with the bronchodilators and the steroids. The patient's even trying to have a conversation, but as you can imagine, it would be very difficult because the CPAP machine and BiPAP machines push air into your lungs, and it's similar to driving down the highway with your head held outside the window and trying to talk. So that is extremely difficult. Thankfully, just then his family arrives and they're able to provide some collateral information. The family states that the patient does have inhalers at home that he is supposed to be using but ran out of those inhalers about one to two months ago. So he's just been trying to get by, waiting on making another appointment with his primary care doctor. However, over the last several days, his breathing has been getting steadily worse and today it just acutely worsened and he was having a very hard time breathing and speaking, which is why they called the ambulance. He does have a smoking history and smokes about one pack a day and has been doing so for the last 20 years. Three months ago, he obtained an official diagnosis of COPD. So when we put all this information together in a patient with COPD who does have 
chronic breathing conditions at home for which he's supposed to be on medications but hasn't been able to take those medications because he ran out. His examination showed wheezing, low oxygen levels, fast breathing, fast heart rate, and chest x-ray that, that did not show any signs of infection. This is what a COPD exacerbation looks like in the emergency department. The severity of your symptoms will determine whether or not the ED provider will offer you to get admitted to the hospital or discharge you home. This 69-year-old gentleman will most likely be getting admitted to the hospital. But if you came into the emergency department with some mild shortness of breath and some wheezing that cleared up significantly with just some bronchodilators in the emergency department and maybe steroids, you may not have to be admitted, especially if your oxygen levels are not low and you feel better and back essentially to your normal after just minimal amounts of interventions. I mentioned smoking in this case example because smoking is one of the main causes in the U.S. for COPD. According to the CDC, every year over 800,000 people present to the emergency department with a diagnosis of COPD exacerbation. May this video serve as a public service announcement encouraging all who currently smoke to stop. I hope that you gained some value from this video and have a better understanding of what you can expect in the emergency department if you were to present as a patient or you had a loved one present to the emergency department as a patient with shortness of breath, but more specifically, a COPD exacerbation. If you found value in what you heard today and would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to this YouTube channel Give me a thumbs up, hit that notification button so that you're notified of future videos when they're released and share with your friends and loved ones. Until we meet again, stay safe. Got nothing else to tell, subscribe and hit the bell. Smash that like button, dash it, stop fronting. Until we meet again, yeah, share it with a friend. Dr. JB is my name and medicine is my game.